This video is brought to you by Mubi, a curated streaming service showing exceptional films from all around the globe. Get an entire month free at Mubi.com slash Final Girl Studios. If you're interested in more essay content from me, I wanted to remind you that you can find me on Substack. My most recent essay titled is 40 the New Fat, The Sephora Kids Are Heroin Chic's Dark Shadow, in which I discuss the growing number of kids obsessed with skincare, online discourse surrounding aging, and the lingering impacts of the heroin chic early 2000s tabloid era. The link is in my description. See you there! The Last Unicorn is an animated feature unlike many others. It remains to be a story of whimsy and fantasy like other animated fairy tales, however, there is an untethered melancholy that is woven throughout this film that separates this film from other children's fantasy films. One cannot help but feel the grief that pulses through this film only moments after the opening credits begin to roll. Although set in a fantastical land of unicorns and wizards, The Last Unicorn offers a profound insight into the very essence of what makes us human. The unicorn Amalthea is a very peculiar character. She comes to represent many things within the story, including femininity, innocence, girlhood, God, and nature. One of the most potent themes embodied by the unicorn is the innocence of childhood, something precious yet fleeting, something that is to be protected. However, there is additionally something inherently feminine about the unicorn Amalthea and what she represents. In some ways, she represents girlhood, and in others, she represents God. And in every way, she represents the union between the two. I am reminded of the quote by Kristen Chang, which I have quoted a couple times on this channel, Godhood is just like girlhood, a begging to be believed. When the men speak of unicorns in the beginning, they speak of them in a way that suggests they are a force that cannot be seen, however one knows they are there, much like God. Girlhood like Godhood is always fleeting. Girlhood like Godhood is always on the cusp of disbelief. Girlhood like Godhood sits within a dichotomous space of illusion, performance, and yet a genuine, palpable, raw reality. Something you inherently know so intimately and yet forget so quickly. In the beginning of the film, two hunters pass through the enchanted woods searching for game. However, they are unsuccessful, leading them to believe they are in the territory of a unicorn whose magical aura keeps the animals safe. As the hunters leave, they call out to the unicorn, warning her that she may be the last of her kind. This comment begins to plant doubt and worry into the mind of the unicorn, and she ventures out of her enchanted forest to seek answers. That cannot be. Why would I be the last? What do men know? Because they have seen no unicorns for a while does not mean that we have all vanished. We do not vanish. There has never been a time without unicorns. We live forever. We are as old as the sky, old as the moon. We can be hunted, trapped, we can even be killed if we leave our forests, but we do not vanish. As Amalthea journeys into the human world, she is met by a butterfly who warns her of a strange creature called the Red Bull. The butterfly explains that this creature is responsible for herding the unicorns to the ends of the earth, resulting in the near extinction of the unicorns. The unicorn and the bull are largely representative of the suppressed feminine and the toxic masculine. In the cybernetic hypothesis, French philosopher and sociologist Jean-Francois Lyotard is quoted saying, the, the capitalist is a conqueror and the conqueror is a monster, a centaur. Its four quarters are nourished by the reproduction of regulated systems of metamorphosis controlled under the law of the commodity standard, and its hind quarters by looting overexcited energies. With one hand, he appropriates, therefore retains. That is to say, reproduces with an equivalence, reinvests, and the other, he takes and destroys, steals and flees, hollowing out another space, another time. 
The unicorn represents nature, while the Red Bull represents capitalist and colonial forces that seek to destroy in their systematic consumption. The centaur, as is stated by Lyotard, in many cultures across the globe, the earth is referred to in a maternal sense, such as Mother Earth. However, this parallel between the feminine and the land goes beyond cultural teachings and shows up in the symbiotic violence perpetuated against both the land and women. For example, extractive projects across the Americas will often Often locate their projects such as pipelines or tar sands within close proximity to indigenous reserves and communities. These projects lead to an increase in non-indigenous men in proximity to indigenous women, who are already at a higher risk of targeted violence. In 2009, the tar sands region of Alberta, Canada saw the country's highest rate of domestic violence. The destruction of the land actively and directively contributes to the rates of missing and murdered indigenous women and two-spirit. I am I'm completely against the camp coming to our territory of Mi'kma'ki because of the the factors surrounding the camps. It's it's truth, it's reality. The extraction sites where camps spring up cause more violence to our women than any any other time. This is also deeply related to the active and ongoing genocide of the Palestinian people, which also has roots in corporate greed, disproportionately impacting women and girls. According to UNICEF, it is estimated that 180 mothers are giving birth in Gaza each day, most often without access to proper medical care, at times giving birth in the rubble of the war-torn land. Amalthea's experience parallels this. Amalthea is evidently used to represent the feminine, and likewise, nature is repeatedly showcased in a way that likely indicates a relation to the feminine. The Red Bull is forcibly displacing the unicorns for the satisfaction of the king, as it is later revealed. The same way the greed of a handful of wealthy elites are responsible for the destruction of our own natural world and the displacement of many people's I am reminded of a passage that can be found in the journal of Jeff Buckley. Buckley wrote, The bastardization of all that is feminine, the outright war against the feminine in all things waged by man, is the death of mankind, plain and simple. The destruction of the land by colonial force is always intertwined with the destruction of the feminine, and we see this represented by Amalthea and the other unicorns. As Amalthea continues to venture outside of her enchanted woods, she is struck by the realization that most humans no longer recognize her. Instead, they mistake her for a pretty white mare. However, the first human to recognize the unicorn for what she is is a witch named Mommy Fortuna. Fortuna travels with a magician named Schmendrick, who is unable to recognize Amalthea, instead mistaking her for a mare like the others. I see a horse, just, just a white mare. Though Fortuna, recognizing Amalthea for what she is, quickly traps Amalthea to display her in her traveling circus. Amalthea is quick to notice the spells placed on the other animals in order to make them seem enchanting. A sick monkey is disguised as a satyr. A malnourished lion plays the role of a manticore, merely mirages to mask the mundane. It is only Amalthea and a vicious harpy that are truly enchanting creatures within the circus. Most humans are unable to see Amalthea's horn and therefore are unable to see her for the unicorn that she is. Due to this, the witch places a fake horn atop Amalthea's real horn so the common eye can see Amalthea as a unicorn. The fake horn to prove that Amalthea is a unicorn to the untrained eye reminds me of the way that we as women perform femininity. It feels almost passe and obvious to say at this point, especially with the rise of memes online with the text to be a woman is to perform. However, the point still stands, Amalthea as a representation of femininity must adorn herself in the facade of what she already is, in the same way women mold our appearance to enhance the femininity we already embody. And to make this abundantly clear, this goes for trans women as well, if anything even more so. Whilst caged by the witch, Amalthea notices that she is not the only genuinely mythical creature within the circus. 
Whilst the others are ordinary animals with a spell to make them look enchanted, Amalthea and the Harpy are the only truly magical creatures. The use of the Harpy is very interesting and evidently intentional to contrast the unicorn. Harpies are creatures from Greek and Roman mythology. They are monsters often depicted with the body of a bird and the face of a woman, but they always embody some combination of elements from a bird of prey and a woman. Harpies are often depicted as cruel and violent, said to carry off their victims into the sky, never to be seen again. Whilst Amalthea represents the gentle, innocent, yet maternal nature of femininity, the harpy represents the opposite, the rage and the power of femininity. Amalthea is aware that they are two sides of the same coin and says, And let her go. I cannot see her caged. She is real, like me. We are two sides of the same magic. The harpy later stares at Amalthea and confirms this when she says, Let me free. We are sisters, you and I. Women are so often represented in extremes, which we have spoken about a lot on this channel. The Madonna and the Whore, the Maiden and the Chrome, the Ingenue and the Witch, the White Swan and the Black Swan, the Unicorn and the Harpy. This dichotomy likewise shows up in their names. The Harpy is named Seleno. Seleno is a Greek name that translates to the Dark One. Additionally, Amalthea is also a name of Greek origin translating to Tender Goddess. The name Amalthea is likewise said to be an epithet signifying the presence of an earlier nurturing goddess or maiden goddess, thus reinforces Amalthea as a representative of both innocent and maternal essence. Amalthea embodies the Madonna archetype in its truest form, maternal yet pure and innocent, whilst the harpy represents the horror with her bare breasts, untethered rage, and unpredictable nature. Inez Nin wrote in her diary, I will always be the virgin prostitute, the perverse angel, the two-faced, sinister, and saintly woman. When Amalthea says that her and the harpy are two sides of the same magic, this is what she is referring to, as is the harpy when she says, we are sisters, you and I, because the Madonna and the whore were never intended to be enemies in the natural world. Amalthea, with the help of Schmendrick, is able to escape. In the process, she also frees the other creatures of the carnival, including the harpy. Upon freeing the harpy, the harpy murders the witch that enslaved them. When the wizard asks Amalthea if she can feel regret, Amalthea replies, And you, you have no regrets as I do. I can never regret. I can feel sorrow, but it's not the same thing. Sorrow and melancholy are common attributes that can be associated with Amalthea even before she is human. Where Amalthea represents melancholy, the harpy represents rage, another example of their dichotomous representation of womanhood, and which we deem to be more consumable and acceptable. Leslie Jameson wrote in her essay, I used to insist I didn't get angry, not anymore. If an angry woman makes people uneasy, then her more palatable counterpart, the sad woman, summons sympathy more readily. She often looks beautiful in her suffering, ennobled, transfigured, elegant. Angry women are messier. Their pain threatens to cause more collateral damage. It's as if the prospect of a woman's anger harming other people threatens to rob her of her social capital she has gained by being wronged. We are most comfortable with female anger when it promises to regulate itself, to refrain from recklessness, to stay civilized. This dichotomy is represented perfectly by the sorrowful unicorn and the vengeful harpy. Schmendrick accompanies Amalthea on her journey to find the Red Bull and the Lost Unicorns. However, soon Schmendrick is captured by a troop of bandits. Amalthea rescues Schmendrick and in the process attracts the attention of the bandits' leader's mistress, Molly Grew. One of the most moving scenes in this film is when Amalthea is seen by Molly for the first time. The woman immediately recognizes the unicorn for what she is and is immediately overwhelmed with a wide array of emotions. From joy to grief, the woman begins to cry, shouting at Amalthea, Can it truly be? <gasps> Where have you been? <gasps> Where have you been? 
The unicorn is unfazed by the woman's reaction to her, calmly replying, I'm here now. The woman continues to navigate her confused emotions as she speaks to Amalthea. And where were you 20 years ago? 10 years ago? Where were you when I was new? When I was one of those innocent young maidens you always come to? How dare you? How dare you come to me now when I am this? <laughs> the woman cries. This scene is one of the most gut-wrenching moments of the film and never ceases to bring tears to my eyes because I profoundly understand the grief that is being expressed by the woman in this moment. The unicorn, as mentioned, represents innocence. The woman sees the unicorn as a reflection of the innocence that she no longer possesses, the innocence that she has lost through the hardships of life. At the same time, the unicorn represents God and faith. For little girls, stories of magic and mythology come to be intertwined with our ideas of God. The age I stopped searching for fairies was the same age I stopped searching for God. Molly, in many ways, grieves the loss of the innocence of her girlhood when she sees the unicorn. She has grown cynical with age, as many of us do. Molly is likewise upset because her meeting with the unicorn doesn't match the childlike image she has of the mythology in her head. The stories of unicorns, fairies, and mermaids often center young and innocent maidens, as the woman suggests. She no longer fits into the mold of this story. As Gia Tolentino wrote in Trick Mirror, if you were a girl and you were imagining your life through literature, you would go from innocence in childhood to sadness in adolescence to bitterness in adulthood, at which point, if you hadn't killed yourself already, you would simply disappear. Molly no longer fits the image of salvation that has been planted in her mind. Likewise, this youthful image of salvation can often be seen in biblical depictions. Salvation and beauty come to be synonymous with one another, especially for a woman. Molly joins Schmendrick and Amalthea on their journey, and as the trio makes their way towards King Haggard's castle, they are confronted by a monstrous fire elemental, the Red Bull. Schmendrick panics and turns Amalthea into a human girl in order to disguise her from the Red Bull. It works. Molly is immediately upset, yelling at Schmendrick, You are an idiot! Do you hear me? You've lost her! You've trapped her in a human body! She'll go mad! For she understands the curse of a woman's body on a being so pure and innocent. At the time of meeting Molly, Amalthea could not possibly comprehend the mourning that Molly expressed, as Amalthea is immortal. Though when Amalthea transforms into a girl, she is immediately struck with the wide range of emotions that humans are gifted with. Amalthea immediately expresses a great deal of grief for her new human body. She pleads with Schmendrick to return her back to her unicorn body. Her first words in her new human body are, What have you done to me? I'm a unicorn. I'm a unicorn. I wish you had let the Red Bull take me. I wish you had left me to the harpy. I can feel this body dying all around me. This is one of the most potent and heartbreaking lines of the film because it is so resonant. To be immortal and then suddenly thrust into a body with such a short lifespan in comparison to forever would be incredibly jarring. It is the passing of time and this fear of inevitable death that drives so much of humanity and largely defines it. This once again cements Amalthea as a metaphor for innocence and childhood and more specifically girlhood. As Amalthea is transformed into a woman, she is struck with, Im with immense grief and the fear of the passing of time. There is a distinct moment in childhood that we as humans are likewise struck with this realization. I remember as a small child crying myself to sleep on many nights because I knew that because I was born, I one day must die, and how unfair that reality was. Adrian Rich wrote in Of Woman Born, the body has been so problematic for women that it has often been easier to shrug it off and travel as a disembodied spirit. However, there is another moment in early adulthood that one begins to realize how fast the passing of time truly is. 
When I began to go through puberty and my body began to shift into womanhood, I felt so much of the same emotions that Amalthea expresses here. Suddenly, I became hyper aware of my body and the changes occurring, and I grew incredibly sorrowful. From the moment I was 12, it was as if I was struck with this unshakable melancholy that permeated my entire being. The march to the grave suddenly felt like a sprint and it feels very similar to the grief that Amalthea expresses here. I believe women come face to face with their own mortality much sooner than most men. Amalthea states, And I'm afraid of this human body more than I was of the Red Bull. Women and those with a uterus are confronted repeatedly with the passing of time due to the cyclical nature of the female body. When a young girl begins to menstruate, she is told, you are a woman now, despite only being in her early teens or having yet to hit her teen years. Trans women are likewise confronted with mortality due to the escalated levels of fatal violence against trans women. Amalthea cries, I was innocent and wise and full of pain. Now that I'm a woman, everything is strange. This is another line that makes me tear up by reading it. This line perfectly encapsulates the feeling of blossoming from girlhood to womanhood. Amalthea begins to forget things and talks often about feeling lonely. When I hit puberty, with it came intense and newfound feelings of despair and loneliness. Like Molly grew, and like other girl-turned women before and after her, Amalthea grows haunted by the loss of innocence innate to womanhood. In the same way, Amalthea is still a unicorn despite her woman body, it is strange to be treated like a woman when you still feel like a girl. Sylvia Plath wrote in Letters to Home, I am afraid of getting older. I am afraid of getting married. Spare me from cooking three meals a day. Spare me from the relentless cage of routine. I want to be free. I want, I think, to be omniscient. I think I would like to call myself the girl who wanted to be God, yet if I were not in this body, where would I be? Perhaps I am destined to be classified and qualified, but oh, I cry out against it. I am. I am powerful, but to what extent? However, Schmendrick insists that Amalthea stay in this human form for her safety, and that the magic knew to change her into a human for a reason. The magic knew what it was doing. In this shape alone, you have some hope of reaching King Haggard and finding out what has become of the other unicorns. So she is, for the time being, stuck in the body of a woman. When the trio make it to King Haggard's castle, Schmendrick introduces the unicorn as Lady Amalthea and requests that they become members of Haggard's court. At first unwelcoming, Haggard eventually agrees to lodge the trio, replacing the more competent wizard Mabrook with Schmendrick and setting Molly Grew to work in the scullery. The wizard Mabrook leaves after recognizing Amalthea for what she truly is, jeering that by allowing her into his castle, Haggard has invited his doom. After Amalthea is turned into a human, she frequently expresses feelings of isolation and loneliness. Robin Wall Kimmerer, indigenous Potawatomi author, wrote in Braiding Sweetgrass, Philosophers call this state of isolation and disconnection species loneliness, a deep, unnamed sadness stemming from estrangement from the rest of creation from the loss of relationship. As our human dominance of the world has grown, we have become more isolated, more lonely when we can no longer call out to our neighbors. It's no wonder that naming was the first job the creator gave Nana Bojo. This is the type of loneliness Amalthea is experiencing. She is disconnected from the rest of the unicorns as she is, to her knowledge, the last. Likewise, she is disconnected from humans as she is not truly a human herself, merely wrapped in the flesh of one. She is also disconnected from the land, the meadows she roamed, and instead she is confined to the cold, dark stone castle. When Amalthea speaks to the king for the first time alone, the king says, There is only one thing that has ever made me happy. Here, the king alludes to the unicorns, though at this point, Amalthea has been human for so long, she has begun to forget much of her identity and past as a unicorn. She questions him and he grows angry, believing she is trying to deceive him to take the unicorns. The king invites Amalthea to gaze at the sea with him. There they are. There they are. They are mine. 
They belong to me. The Red Bull gathered them for me one by one, and I bade him drive each one into the sea. Now they live there. I like to watch them. They fill me with joy. The first time I felt it, I thought I was going to die. I said to the Red Bull, I must have them. I must have all of them, all there are, for nothing makes me happy. But their shining and their grace. So the Red Bull caught them. Each time I see the unicorns, my unicorns, it is like that morning in the woods, and I am truly young in spite of myself. The king seeks to capture the unicorn so their beauty fills a void inside of him. Beauty is the crux of culture. Everyone at one point desires beauty and many spend our entire lives longing for beauty. To either possess it for oneself or to possess it in the form of another, such as sleeping with beautiful women or encaging all the unicorns of the world for your own viewing pleasure. From the moment Amalthea escaped the safety of her magical meadow, she was faced with being hunted and encaged, a feeling many women can relate to. I am reminded of the quote by Sylvia Plath, being born a woman is an awful tragedy. Yes, my consuming desire to mingle with road crews, sailors and soldiers, barroom regulars, to be a part of a scene, anonymous, listening, recording, all is spoiled by the fact that I am a girl, a female always in danger of assault and battery. My consuming interest in men and their lives is often misconstrued as a desire to seduce them or as an invitation to intimacy. Yet, God, I want to talk to everybody I can as deeply as I can. I want to be able to sleep in an open field, to travel west, to walk freely at night. The unicorn likewise shares a similar experience. To be something so rare and precious is to be desired. To be desired is to be hunted. The unicorn cannot wander so freely in a world that seeks to capture and cage her magic. King Hagrid's son, Prince Lear, falls for Amalthea as soon as he lays eyes on her. He attempts to impress her through traditionally heroic actions such as slaying dragons, though Amalthea is unimpressed. Prince Lear explains this to Molly. And then she looked at me, and I was sorry I had killed the thing. Sorry for killing a dragon. To which Molly replies, You know, your highness, I really think you should try something else. But what's left on Earth that I haven't tried? Giants, ogres, black knights, terrible tasks, fatal riddles? Molly, for her sake, I've become a hero, but my great deeds mean nothing to her. Then perhaps the Lady Amalthea is not to be won by great deeds. The prince goes on to explain that he only wishes to help and serve her, though she won't even speak to him. Molly later speaks to Amalthea, saying she is cruel for ignoring the prince. Amalthea can only stare at the ocean, unconcerned with the prince, she says. Molly, who am I? Why am I here? What, what is it that I'm seeking in this strange place, day after day? I, I, I knew a moment ago... But I've forgotten. Amalthea is disillusioned by the prince, but it is only when he writes her a poem and shows her some vulnerability that she begins to fall for him. The prince has not internalized the destructive nature of the king or the Red Bull and shows the softer, nurturing side of masculinity that desires to assist and protect Amalthea rather than destroy her. Through this, Amalthea begins to learn what romantic love is, even considering abandoning her quest in favor of such a mortal love. Though, in spite of her newfound love, Amalthea is unable to fully immerse herself in joy and possesses a persistent melancholy. Even as she begins to forget who she is, where she comes from, and her quest, she does not forget the sorrow. She forgets what she grieves, but she cannot forget the grief that pulses through her. Grief is such a prominent thread woven throughout the story, and any time I think of grief, I think of the following quotes by Andrew Garfield. I have never read more beautiful and accurate musings on grief than I have from Andrew Garfield. He writes in reflection of losing his mother. I went for a walk on the beach. 
The sun was setting and it was freezing. I found I needed to jump, so I jumped into the sea. And it's funny, as soon as my full body and head were submerged, it was like I got the medicine and my chest released and I let it all go. My interpretation of that moment was that it was the wisdom of nature, the wisdom of the earth and the wisdom of the ocean letting me know, hey, yeah, it's hard, it's horrible. I'm not taking away this unique pain you're feeling, but just know us out here, us water molecules, we've been seeing this for a millennia. And actually, this is the best case scenario for you to lose her rather than for her to lose you. This is a much better situation. And again, my ego was holding on. My ego thought I knew better. My ego said, no, this doesn't make sense. No, 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 it shouldn't be this way. It should be that way. But actually, it took the ocean, the greater opponent, to just hold me under and say, it's really horrible. And sons have been losing their mothers for thousands and thousands of years, and they will continue to. And you've been initiated into that awareness and into that reality. Some illusion has been lifted. You're in a realer version of the world now, and it's painful. Andrew's relating of grief and the natural world I find to be incredibly relevant to The Last Unicorn. The cyclical nature of the natural world and the inherent grief that accompanies it. And in a similar sense, the ocean plays an important role here as well. As Amalthea begins to forget who she is, she stares intuitively out to the sea for answers. And the sea is eventually where her answers lay as well. Molly, Schmendrick, Amalthea, and the prince are soon able to find the lair of the Red Bull, though they become trapped in the process. Amalthea has become attached to her human form and the love she feels within it, enough to give up the prospect of freeing the unicorns and returning to her unicorn form. Don't let him change me. The Red Bull has no care for human beings. We may walk out past him and get away. If we do that... All of the unicorns of the world will remain prisoners forever except one, and she will grow old and die. Everything dies. I want to die when you die. I'm no unicorn, no magical creature. I'm human, and I love you. Don't let him. Lear, I will not love you when I'm a unicorn. However, soon the Red Bull appears and recognizes Amalthea for the unicorn she is in spite of her human shell. As the Red Bull approaches Amalthea, Schmender casts a spell, returning Amalthea to her rightful unicorn body. The unicorns are trapped in the sea and Amalthea frees the unicorns by driving the Red Bull to the sea. When the Red Bull is engulfed by the water, the unicorns rise from the sea in a triumphant wave. When the Red Bull is engulfed by the water, the patriarchy falls quite literally. As the Red Bull disappears into the sea, the king's castle falls and the king too falls into the sea. After bringing the prince back to life, Amalthea stands on a cliff from afar and says, I remember you. I remember. The magician Schmendrick then later says to the prince, She will remember your heart when men are fairy tales and books written by rabbits. Of all unicorns, she is the only one who knows what regret is and love. To regret is to remember. Regret remembrance, and grief are all an extension of love. I am again reminded of the musings by Andrew Garfield as he discusses grieving his mother and also working as the late Jonathan Larson for the film adaptation of Tick, Tick, Boom, a film and stage production that likewise grapples with the very human experience of the anxiety of time and the way in which this dictates our emotions. This is all the unexpressed love, Andrew says. The grief that will remain with us until we pass because we never get enough time with each other no matter whether someone lives until 60 or 15 or 99. I hope this grief stays with me because it is all the unexpressed love that I didn't get to tell her. And I told her every day she was the best of us. I got to sing Jonathan Larson's unfinished song while simultaneously singing for my mother and her unfinished song. This film is to do with the ticking clock that we all have, and we all know somewhere deep down that life is sacred. Life is short, and we better just be here as much as possible with each other holding on to each other. As humans, it is our knowledge of time that largely dictates much of our actions and emotions. 
As humans, we are unsure of to what degree other animals are conscious of the passing of time and the inevitability of death, but we do know that as humans, our awareness of this is what drives us. We create in pursuit of something larger than ourselves and hope our creations will surpass us in some way. We take photos in our youth so as to remember that version of ourselves when we grow old. We journal thinking of those who will read our most intimate thoughts after we are gone. Much of the greatest atrocities and the greatest goods are pursued due to this fleeting nature of humanity, to preserve the flesh in something greater than oneself. Without the backdrop of anxiety surrounding the fleeting nature of time, Amalthea has a limited or different range of emotions in comparison to humans. As she said in the beginning of the movie, she can feel sorrow, however, she cannot regret. And when she is turned into a human, the primary paralyzing sensation is where her unicorn body was eternally preserved by immortality, her human flesh is constantly in a state of decay. Amalthea is a god wrapped in the flesh of a girl, and it drives her mad. To be a spirit so grand, so divine, confined to a much smaller space than she is accustomed to, with a ticking clock attached to it. She traded her immortal body for a bomb that day in the woods. She grows haunted by the ticking. She is driven to madness, though in this madness she finds salvation in the form of mortal love. As the magician says, of all unicorns in the world, Amalthea is the only unicorn who knows the feeling of regret and love. To love something is to cherish it, because you know it is fleeting. As Amalthea bids farewell to her unlikely friends, she says, I am a little afraid to go home. I have been mortal, and some part of me is mortal yet. I am no longer like the others, for no unicorn was ever born who could regret, but now I do. I regret. In the same way she was never truly a human because of her unicorn soul, she will never be entirely unicorn again. For flecks of the human spirit have forever mixed with her immortal soul, and immortal that human spirit remains inside of her. In the same way, even as we grow into our adult bodies, our girlhood remains nuzzled up inside of us. As the immortal essence of the ocean preserves endless cherished lockets of grief for time immemorial, Amalthea's immortal soul will do the same. Amalthea has learned the precious nature of mortality and therefore she cannot unlearn it. To regret is to have known, to have lost, and to have loved. Mubi is a curated streaming service dedicated to elevating great cinema from all around the globe. From iconic directors to emerging auteurs, there is always something new to discover. With Mubi, each and every film is hand-selected by its team of curators, so you can discover the best of cinema at your fingertips, streaming anytime, anywhere. One thing I adore about Mubi is their dedication to spotlighting female directors and making the works of female directors incredibly accessible in their Reframing Women Directors section of the platform. As they state in this section, for as long as the movies have existed, women have been making them. Mubi does an incredible job of platforming women in cinema from the women who helped birth the art form to modern women breaking into the industry today. And you can try Mubi free for 30 days at Mubi.com slash Final Girl Studios. That's M-U- bi.com slash final girl studios for a full month of great cinema for free thank you again to Mubi for sponsoring this video and thank you guys for watching bye